say. I had a math problem when I was looking at my notes and my slides and so forth. I've got 50 minutes with you. I have two demos, and I had about 100 slides. And it wasn't adding up. So we're not going to go through that. I've trimmed things down quite a bit. We're going to try to make this a somewhere in that sweet spot between fast-paced and relaxed. Um, so don't, uh, we're not going to get too much into a lot of really deep technical detail on a lot of things. We're going to talk about some things that are more architecture related, some things that are technical, some things that are tooling. Uh, and if you're wondering who is this guy, my name is Zachary Klein and I work as a principal software engineer at Object Computing Incorporated. Um, I was at the last Dev Nexus in 2020 and I'm glad to be back uh, with you all again this year for the, this grand return. And I'm an open source contributor to a couple of uh, frameworks that our company sponsors. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and our website's there at the bottom. So let's jump right into it. So single page apps and microservices. Not two terms that, at least in my experience, are often bandied together and compared and contrasted. Um, but there is a method to my madness, so uh, stay with me. What's, uh, let's just define a single page app. And let me get a read of the room here real quick. Uh, how many here? Um, work with JavaScript. Okay. Now, how about Java, the Java language? That's perfect. That's really who this talk is for. It's people who, who whether you're a front-end developer who's moved to the back-end or vice versa, you've got your feet kind of in both worlds, in the front-end and the back-end. Sometimes we call ourselves full-stack developers. Uh, regardless, um, you probably have some, familiar, some familiarity with the concept, anyways, of a single-page application. Typically, they're written in JavaScript. We use frameworks like React or Vue.js or Angular or whatever the new framework is this week. Did something happen to the screen there? Yeah, it did. Um, okay, so I just got to keep moving. Okay, good, good to know. Uh, I can't see what's happening over there, so someone wave if that happens again because uh, it's completely out of my line of sight here. Um, so typically, these single-page applications, they run in your browser or they could run natively through some framework like Electron. And by single page, it's a single bundle of JavaScript. It's a single view that can dynamically update, interacts with usually some sort of a REST API or some backend. Um, and I've already mentioned some, uh, the, some of those uh, pop more popular frameworks and the ones that I'm personally familiar with are those big three. So we've, you can see a simple uh, React app with, created with the CLI. Now, microservices, on the other hand, aren't related to this at all. Microservices is a distributed architecture or, or pattern for backend development, for building web services, right? And typically, these services are independently buildable, deployable. They can be scaled independently. We hear terms like a bounded context, so the idea that a microservice has a set of concerns, a set of data that it is interested in, that it controls, and that it exposes to the rest of the world separation of concerns, um, and then popular frameworks, at least in the Java ecosystem, which I think most of us uh, are in, would be obviously Spring Boot. Uh, we've heard a lot about Quarkus at this event and also at uh, also Micronaut, which um, I was in a Micronaut talk a couple of sessions ago. Um, now Micronaut, I'm gonna, that's just laid out here. I actually contribute to this framework. Um, and so this is my choice of a Java microservices framework. And so we will be talking about Micronaut in this talk. However, the principles, the ideas, I'm going to keep them general. You don't need to know Micronaut to benefit from this talk, but you are going to learn a bit about it, and I think uh, you'll like what you see. So ultimately, I'm the one giving the talk, so this is how it goes. If I use something else, uh, then that's what we'll be talking about. But Micronaut is really one of the first Java frameworks um, that's come out over the past few years that really was designed for the cloud and for cloud native. Um, it came out in October of 2018, and it was designed with the lessons learned from frameworks like Spring or Grails, these uh, frameworks that are typically associated or have been associated with monolithic service applications. So what does Micronaut bring to the table? Well, it's a reactive framework. It's natively reactive. It's built on the Netty HTTP server. And it uh, uses an approach called ahead of time compilation, um, which is analogous to uh, what you might hear about uh, with the Quarkus framework. And, and there, there are similarities there. Uh, although the difference being that Micronaut does not transform your bytecode. So if you're nerdy like that, um, that, that is the, a, a pretty big distinction between the two. It layers additional bytecode uh, that lives in the same package along with your own code, but it doesn't modify uh, the code that you write. 
It's a natively cloud native framework. And what that means is that Micronaut is built for microservices. It's built for a distributed environment. And so things like service discovery, load balancing, circuit breakers, tracing, support for these kinds of patterns are built into the framework. It supports Java, Kotlin, and Groovy. And of course, it plays very well with uh, Graal VM. If any of you were in the talk by Bert Beckwith, you would have seen that in action a little bit. Um, that's a slide's a little bit buggy there. So to get started with Micronaut, you can go to launch.micronaut.io. You can generate a project. You don't need to install anything. You just need a working JVM on your machine, and you're good to go. You can download the project, and it includes the, a wrapper to run it with either Maven or Gradle. Quick snippet of some code just so you see what this looks like. It really should look familiar to you if you've done anything in the MVC world with Java, uh, whether it's Spring or some other framework. Um, you know, you've already probably seen these sorts of annotation-based APIs. We have a controller here. It's exposing some sort of a REST endpoint. Um, it's a Git endpoint in this case. It takes a query or a URL parameter called name, and then we have a method that then prints out a response, and that's what gets written out to the client. Speaking of clients, because Micronaut is natively cloud native, uh, it also includes a built-in HTTP client. And the, the real cool thing about this, and this will become important later on the talk, um, is that with Micronaut, your clients and your controllers are, they, they, they end up having similar or even identical method signatures, right? Because the client and the controller are using the same API. They use the same HTTP annotations. They use the same URI templates. And so this makes it really easy and really fluid to write services that talk to each other in a distributed architecture. And uh, there's really no overhead involved. The implementation for the HTTP client is generated at compile time. And I'm going to mention that again one more time here. Micronaut obviously has dependency injection like you'd expect from any good uh, JVM framework. It's JSR 330 uh, compliant. Um, but again, the thing that makes Micronaut special is that it does dependency injection. It does uh, the HTTP client implementations and so forth. It does all of this when you build and compile your code as opposed to more traditional JVM frameworks which have done this using reflection and using runtime uh, metaprogramming and proxies and so forth. Uh, Micronaut does all this when you compile your code, and that means, for one, it um, has a much lower memory footprint, much faster startup time, and if you're interested in things like native image and Graal VM, which don't support reflection, or at least they don't support, it's, it's not very uh, straightforward, um, Micronaut applications don't have that. Again, I said natively cloud native, and just a couple quick code snippets so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, at the top there, we have an example of a uh, HTTP client that is talking to a service that is using service discovery. So we don't know where this service is running, right? It's being registered through some uh, third-party uh, service uh, discovery, service registry. Maybe we're using console. Maybe we're using Kubernetes. And we're going to just call out for a service ID and expect that there's somebody out there that's going to get us to the right instance that we, of the service we want to talk to. Uh, we can annotate our client with at retriable, and this uh, takes care of situations where a REST request may actually fail, and we want to try again. And then we have circuit breakers, which is essentially just a improvement, a, a, a layer on top of the retriable annotation, which will give a number of attempts, some configurable number of attempts, and then when it, if it continues to fail, it, rather than swamping that downstream resource, it'll simply uh, return the last um, exception. So the point of all this is that Micronaut is is an example of a framework that is really designed with microservices and the cloud first and foremost in mind, and it makes that type of programming and that type of system design much more straightforward. And there's always a benefit, of course, to using the right tool for the job. So Micronaut is, uh, I think, a, a, in my opinion, a prime example of one of these types of frameworks. So again, why are we contrasting single page applications and microservices? This seems kind of like an Apple and oranges uh, comparison. And you're right, they, they are, because single page application, that's referring to a way of developing things in the front end, whereas the microservices pattern apparently belongs entirely on the server and is mostly opaque to the folks working in front end applications. So let's dig into that just a little bit. So traditionally, when we built web apps back in the good old days, you know, the, uh, when we had typically monolithic backends, and we had static HTML pages, and you make a request and get back a page. And you make another request and get back a different page. And pretty soon you proliferate pages, and your web application would grow in complexity. 
And for various reasons, we all know that style of developing web services and web applications has started to fall out of favor. Um, maybe it still works in some situations. It's not a terrible design. Server, uh, server and client is uh, there's a, and a static front end. A lot to be said for that. But these days, we tend to uh, see more commonly this single page application model where the UI is a standalone application that doesn't that is loaded once in the client, be it a browser or be it a uh, mobile device or what have you. And then that bundle of JavaScript and CSS and HTML is then dynamically updating. It's, act it's acting as a more responsive client, a richer client than you would have with a static HTML page. And so typically our backend service is going to be producing some sort of JSON or some some serialized form of data that we are then supplying to the front end, and the front end loads it up in this pretty JavaScript uh, application that we're building. Now, we look at microservice architectures. One thing we should notice right away is that we don't really have a single monolithic backend anymore. We tend to have multiple services that, again, have this idea of a bounded context. They serve a particular set of, of concerns. They hold on to a particular set of data. And they are orchestrated, and they work together, and they communicate with each other. Obviously, this is not an example of ideal microservice design, but you get the idea. It's more complicated than the single backend approach that we traditionally associate. And even today, if you pick up most single page application tutorials, there's just an API. There's just a server. It's, it's, a, it's a very straightforward front end, back end type of, um, of uh, situation. But reality can be a little more complicated. So what are some potential um, problems, or maybe I should say some uh, friction that we might find between the, the microservice world and the way that single page applications like to think about the server side? So microservice architectures provide granularity, right? That's bounded context and separation of concerns and so on and so forth. And there's a lot of benefits to that. As an architect, I like that kind of approach. It makes a lot of sense to me, but it does complicate things a little bit for the UI whether it's a single page application or not, but um, for the UI in general. Uh, services, as we I mentioned previously, they can be registered through service discovery, which means you don't actually know where they're running, and maybe you don't even have access to all of them. The, and at our front end, or single page application, really shouldn't need to be aware of the whole topology of your architecture in the back end. That's not, ideally, you don't want the front end to be aware that there's multiple services going on. And so there's a little bit of a conflict here. And the conflict comes down to, I think, the issue that a user interface is inevitably a cross-cutting concern. Users don't really care that you've got your customers over here and orders over there. And that organization of data and of uh, logic in your architecture has to come together at some point in order for the user to make use of it in a user interface like they expect. So, there's a couple of different ways that we deal with this. And one that we're going to talk more about is kind of the default and uh, one that uh, we probably, if you, if you build single page applications and you have microservices in the background, you, you probably are doing something like this. And then we're going to talk about a second approach, which is a little newer, um, that maybe you're not so familiar with and that I find pretty interesting. Uh, but before I go into the, the specifics, I just want to point out that these approaches all have trade-offs. They're not mutually exclusive. You can do either or both of these things. And so you want to pick the best tool for the job. And it's going to vary depending on the type of application you're building and what you actually want to, uh, how you actually want to think about and reason about your user interface. So the first approach we're going to talk about, I'm calling just traditional REST uh, with an API gateway. And the API gateway could be, and we'll talk about this in detail, but it could be a third-party product or it could be your own application, your own service. I've done both approaches in my, in my own work. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about that, about some of the, uh, the techniques and, and, and tips that might be helpful when you're doing that. The other option is known as micro front ends. And this is a newer pattern. And this is interesting to me because going along with the theme of this talk, it's actually trying to bring, it's, it's actually suggesting that, single, that the front end and microservices aren't as separate as we might think they are, and that maybe the front end could benefit from some of the same principles of microservice design um, and that's where we come up with the idea of micro front ends. So we're going to talk most, uh, probably mostly about number one because it's a little more, a little more established. But I do want to get uh, get to uh, the second approach as well because I do find it very interesting. So let's talk about what is an API gateway. 
And I'm using that term in a generic sense here uh, because API Gateway, it, it's, it can be a product name, right? I mean, Google has one, Amazon has one. So cloud providers will often uh, provide these sorts of API gateways that stand in front of your services and that proxy requests and provide various features. Um, however, that's not the only way you can do it. Um, so here's a, a diagram from a, a, micro, a Microsoft, sorry, um, uh, page that I found uh, helpful in just kind of visualizing this. We have an API gateway that comes between the client and the client application thinks it's just communicating with a single server potentially. And in reality, of course, those requests are being forwarded on to the relevant services that need to handle them. So uh, if we contrast this then with our simplistic or oversimplified backend and frontend model, an API ga a gateway comes in the middle and, and kind of hides the complexity of the backend architecture from the front end. And of course, if you're using a cloud, if you're deploying to the cloud, a lot of cloud providers like Amazon and Google and so forth, they have this as well. So they provide at least that uh, functionality of proxying those requests and sending them out to the right place. And they often provide other features as well. Um, but even if you're not using a cloud provider, this uh, concept, the concept of this approach still uh, can be very useful. Another way to think about this is having a sort of a backend per front end model. And this would be the case if you're actually servicing different types of clients, or at least that's one uh, way this could be useful. So if you're, you may have a one API gateway that's facing for your mobile application, one that's for the web application, and one that's for other types of users that get access to things that, um, that other, uh, the other that you know, the, the regular user might not have access to. Uh, I don't consider this micro front ends, by the way, although it's, it's a bit fuzzy and some people would, would argue that point. But, uh, but aside from simply standing up or using an API gateway that's um, provided for you uh, through some cloud provider or, so, or an open source solution, uh, you can also build a service that functions as an API gateway. And modern uh, uh, microservice frameworks like Micronaut have a lot of the features that you would like to have in building a gateway. And there are, use, there are and, and these are not mutually exclusive. You can build your own gateway service and use a cloud gateway, and there's, there's, not, a, there's not really any uh, cost to that. Um, but I want to talk about a few features that I think are, are really useful in, uh, in building a gateway service. And I'm going to look at it uh, with using Micronaut as our example. But again, these are, these are patterns and features that pretty much all the modern uh, Java web service frameworks have uh, to some degree or another. One of the things that I, I like about Micronaut, though, is the fact that we have this consistent API between the controller, which is exposing endpoints um, to either the front, uh, a, a, a single page application or to another service. We have a consistent API between the controller and the client. So the controller, in this case, could be services that are providing endpoints to the greater system, and the gateway if we're building our own gateway, it's going to be functioning as a client of those services. It's being the client in the stead of the actual single page application, for example. And so we already saw an example of this, but if we look at a controller that might be exposed by some service, then we look at the client, which would be what the gateway will be uh, using to interact with this controller, and you should notice that they're remarkably similar. And so what this means is that you can publish uh, shared interfaces um, you can publish a shared library that has uh, essentially contract interfaces that are uh, used by uh, the gateway to create clients. Notice the client is just an interface. You don't have to write the client. There's no logic to the client. You just define it using the annotation API, and Micronaut actually builds the HTTP client for you at compile time. And then on the controller side, of course, it would be implementing those shared interfaces. And so you can maintain and you can do versioning and so forth that way. And it's an approach that we found, and I found, uh, very useful. And, and if you're interested, by the way, in this the whole issue of when does it make sense to build an API gateway service as opposed to using a, um, a pre-baked one uh, that you just configure, uh, this talk I found very useful um, uh, by a gentleman whose name I can't actually read on my screen, so I'm not going to pronounce it. By the way, the slides are all available, and I've got a QR code at the end that you can take a picture of if you want to find this. So. What does a RESTful API look like when you write one in Micronauts? We have a controller here. Uh, it's annotated with uh, at controller and slash book, so that's going to be its root URI. And then we have all these sorts of CRUD type methods that you'd expect. So we can post a new uh, uh, record to our API. We can update an existing one. We can delete. We can get. 
and we can annotate with at transactional if we want to express to the framework that this is a transactional um, action that we're taking. And all of this is, again, computed at compilation time, which is a real game changer when it comes to building lightweight microservices that uh, do not uh, have a steady increase in their memory consumption as they, as they grow in complexity because the additional complexity, you're gonna pay that cost at compilation time, not at runtime. The framework does not have to do this, uh, uh, does not have to create these, uh, these controllers and, and add the overlays of uh, framework features and so forth at runtime for every class, every method, every field. All of that logic is done when the application is compiled. So we've seen examples of the routes uh, that, you, that you have with the, the various HTTP annotations. Um, you can also, of course, um, access and set headers, cookies, queries, all the things that you'd expect um, to be able to provide a, a full-featured API. Um, and Micronaut makes use of the Jackson library for doing JSON deserialization and serialization. Uh, that's not a Micronaut exclusive. A lot of folks use Jackson. It's a very powerful uh, API. And so the, in the uh, example here, I've got a simple Pojo at the top, and I've got a custom JSON serializer because I want to do something special with the date property on my Pojo. And if I look at what that looks like when I, uh, so I'm going to use the fetch API to make a request against my API and get back the, uh, the, the JSON. Actually, I'm posting the JSON in this case. So now, yeah, I'm sorry. So I, I misspoke there. This is an example of uh, JSON binding. So in this example, we're basically, we're, we're telling Jackson, this is how I, I, I want to, I, I have a custom date format that I want to use. So the birthday in my fetch request is not a standard timestamp like uh, Jackson would normally expect, and so I have my own custom serializer. And the link there at the bottom of the slides is an excellent um, overview of Jackson uh, from the Bail Dung uh, blog, and I highly recommend checking that out. Super powerful library. Uh, for JSON rendering, uh, which is the other side, so now we're exposing JSON from a gateway or from a service. Uh, we can use, uh, th there's all sorts of annotations you can use to customize the default rendering. When you render out a, a POJO um, in Micronaut and a lot of these microservice frameworks, you're, you're going to essentially get you know, key value matching the structure of your POJO. That's just a very common way of doing this. Uh, and, and Jackson behaves the same way, but it's very e easy and straightforward to um, uh, manipulate how that data actually uh, is rendered. So in this particular case, we're renaming uh, the title property, we're calling it name, and we're also telling Jackson to ignore a couple of persistence-related properties, ID and version, so we don't want to show that to our user. When you're uh, building, obviously, a single-page application, you're talking to an, a, a server, whether it be a gateway or just a simple backend, you're gonna wanna make sure you have cores, enabled on your back end because browsers don't actually like it when front ends talk to, when a web application talks to another server, that's considered a security risk. And so that's something that typically has to be allowed uh, by the server. There's a special header that's included. Um, it's a solved problem. Every framework has a, a pretty straightforward solution for it. You can see how we enable it in Micronaut right there. Another cool thing that uh, API gateways uh, tend to off offer is API documentation. And uh, typically this is done with uh, specifications like OpenAPI. And OpenAPI essentially gives you a, a YAML uh, description of your API, all the various endpoints and what the response body looks like, what the request body should look like. And then there's tools like Swagger that can turn this YAML spec into a really impressive interactive HTML um, uh, 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 documentation website which you can host on your gateway or you can host it somewhere else. Um, Micronaut can actually generate this for you, including the HTML, so you can actually in, uh, enable this and host your own interactive API documentation uh, on, your own, uh, on, on your own server, on your own gateway. And we'll see a, a, that in the, in the demo here shortly. Another thing to think about when it comes to gateways is API versioning. So uh, typically when we expose an API and then we have clients that now implement it and now depend on it, then if we want to make changes to the API, we don't want it to break everything for our client. And so typically what you'll do is you'll version the API so that a, so that a new 
so that the, the two versions can essentially ex exist side by side. So you can have a V1 of your API, a V2 of your API, and then when the front end team is ready, they can switch from one to the other, and you can have um, multiple versions running in parallel without any trouble. Um, again, very easy to do with Micronaut. There's a dedicated annotation for it, um, and this, is, this can be set in configuration as well. And the, at, the version annotation there can also be used on Micronaut's client and, um, and, uh, interfaces as well. So you can uh, control what version you're speaking to uh, with when you're doing inter-service calls. By default is pretty much standard. Uh, you're usually gonna use a, a HTTP header like XAPI version to indicate what version of the API you intend to use. And then uh, for security, um, I, typically when you're doing single page applications, you're writing uh, these dynamic front end apps, uh, the most common uh, security model uh, that I see used and I've used myself is stateless security. And that usually revolves around the JSON web token, JWT, or JOT, I guess some people call it. Uh, it's a standard for representing claims. And so it doesn't have to be used for security. Uh, I've used JWT for lots of non-security related things. It's just a handy way of, of representing uh, data in a very standard way between two parties. These tokens can be signed and they form the backbone of the stateless authentication model. And we're not gonna walk through that all in detail here. Uh, the main point is that everything that the server needs to know about the client, about it, the user name, the, the roles, the, the identity and the authorization that this client has, it's all stored in the token. So when we say stateless, what we mean is that the server does not storing any information about the user session. There is no, there's not, not really a concept of a session when you're doing stateless security. Um, and so this is, of course, used for uh, OAuth authentication uh, uh, very commonly. Uh, you can also do it standalone if you're just, if you are your own security, uh, your own authorization server. Um, and uh, Micronaut has a security library that makes this really easy to set up. And then there's an annotation-based API where you can secure either an entire controller or an individual method or endpoint in the controller. So it's very similar to Spring Security. In fact, it's essentially the same API if you're using the annotations. And then there's also a way to set it through configuration as well. Uh, we'll see an example of this again in the demo, so I'm not gonna belabor the point. There's a lot of really excellent guides on setting up Micronaut with uh, various OAuth, OAuth 2 providers like Google, GitHub, Okta, and so forth. So that's something that I recommend you check out. Um, and the, the, the guides are excellent because they are full feature tutorials that give you a beginning state and an end state and all the steps in between. And they're available in all the various languages and build tools that Micronaut supports. So you can, you can read the Java language version with Maven and the Kotlin version with Gradle and it's the exact same steps, the same applications. Related to uh, security and JWT is this idea of token propagation. And this uh, becomes important uh, because if, if you are practicing sort of a no trust security model where the services all require authentication, uh, you want to make sure that they're able to share those access tokens, those JWTs that you're generating, so you can secure your request as it goes through multiple services in your architecture. Some folks don't do this. Sometimes uh, we'll design a system where we say everything's behind a, a virtual private network, or well, not virtual private network, not in a VPN, but you know, uh, the term escapes me, but in sort of like a VPC, I think it is, um, where the services can't be accessed externally. And that's great. Um, but there are times where it just makes sense to enable security on all of your services, and token propagation makes that possible, where the framework essentially includes that token with, within every internal request. So you call out to the gateway, the gateway with an access token, the gateway then calls service A, it passes along the access token, service A then wants to call service B, it passes along the access token, and this is what we mean by token uh, propagation. Typically it's in, embedded in a header, uh, it can also be stored as a cookie, um, and then uh, the services then will specify what other services they share their tokens with. Um, this can be used for security. It can also be used for multi-tenancy, and we're going to see that uh, in the demo here in just a few minutes. Um, so this is how you enable it in, uh, in, in Micronaut. Uh, it's very straightforward. You just basically turn it on. Um, and then this diagram here uh, basically makes the same point I was making. 
So this is uh, a very common uh, uh, feature uh, that we make quite a bit of use of when uh, dealing with microservice architectures in general. And it's definitely something that makes uh, life easier for a front end and a single page application. So let's take a look at a demo here. And I'm realizing that my screen is probably not, there we go. So I'm gonna need to move. No, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and I apologize for the delay here, but I'm gonna turn mirroring back on rather than try to run this with my neck craned out. So I'm gonna go ahead and mirror decimator. Okay, that's the name of the projector. Okay. That's a little bit aggressive, if you ask me, but all right. Um, Command F1. Thank you, Todd. Was that you, Todd? Okay. Sounded like you. All right. Um, and then I want to reduce the screen resolution, not because I hate myself, but because I love you, and I want you to be able to see the screen. Okay, here we go. All right. Is that somewhat more? Oh, no, no, no. You don't get to see my, my micro front ends yet. That's dessert. We're saving that for the end. All right, so I've got everything running here so no one has to wait and watch great old download the internet and all that kind of stuff. I just wanna show you this project here. It's a multi-project build, which you're familiar with. If you're familiar with great you've already seen this uh, before probably, but we've got um, several, we, we've got a total of uh, four uh, services that are running here. We have a gateway service like we've been talking about. We have an inventory service, which is basically managing the data of our application. Then we have an auth service, which is handling authentication. And then our front end is a Vue.js application. So I'm gonna go ahead and first show you the application. Got it running right here. So I can go in here and log in. I'm gonna log in as admin. Well, actually, no, I'll log in as one of my regular users first. I'm gonna log in as makers. Uh, the password is the same for all the users, so it's not really important. Whoops, failed to fetch. That wasn't supposed to happen. Is something not running? Yes, something is not running. My gateway is not running. So, uh, but that's okay. The, uh, so the front end here you can see is running on localhost 3000. So this is my single page application. It's written with an older view, version of Vue.js. It's not the cool new Vue CLI stuff. Uh, anyone here familiar with Vue.js, by the way? A show of hands? Only a couple. Okay, what about React? More, what about Angular? Oh, a little less than React, that's interesting. Uh, Vue.js is almost right in the middle between React and Angular. Um, I've used all three of these frameworks in anger. Uh, I like them all in their own way, but uh, Vue.js really is right about in the middle. It's less complex than Angular. It's easier to get easier to uh, a slow, uh, slower, uh, shallower learning curve than React. Um, and it's, it's actually one of my favorite frameworks, even though I have a very special place in my heart for React. So we're using Vue.js for this particular demo. So I should be able to log in now. Well, I should make sure my, so my gateway is running. Let's make sure that my auth service is running. It is. So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna show you the app here real quick. So I should be able to log in now. There we go. So I'm logged in. I notice that I'm logged in for makers. That's my user here. And I can see my list of widgets or products, which this is my data. Can't really do anything in this application. It's all read only, but I can see the data that pertains to my particular user. And I can see some information as well about my uh, token, which is not rendering for some reason. So I'm gonna go ahead and log out. I'm gonna log back in as admin so you can see something here that might not be immediately obvious. If I log in as an admin, uh, I get a red bar indicating that you know this, this is dangerous. I'm logged in as a super user, but I also now have the ability to pick between the different tenants in my application. So this is a multi-tenant app, which means that in my case, I'm using simply a, uh, a header value uh, but you could imagine an application where you had a subdomain that was tied to a different tenant. So you might have different instances or, or um, manifestations, if you will, of your, of your application for different customers. And that's what multi-tenancy allows you to do. So uh, I have to be either makers or Acme in this example. I can't be both. The data ex is partitioned and such that I need to express to the system what tenant I belong to. And I'm not sure why that one didn't load because we logged into them earlier and it worked fine. But um, we can debug that later on. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and log out here and uh, show you the code that's involved here. Start with the front end. The front end is actually pretty simple um, because again, this, a lot of the complexity here is hidden behind the, the uh, API gateway that we built. So we have a product list, um, which is actually, this is not the my, not my, I'm not the most proud of this uh, product design because I, I don't like that I have data loading happening inside of components, but 
I've got a method here that loads products um, and Vue.js components can have methods, they can have properties. It, it really is a, a nice API to, to learn. Um, let me expand this here, okay. So I make a fetch request. Notice that I know that my gateway is running on localhost 8080, but uh, the inventory is not running there. So we're gonna see that in a moment. I actually, I don't know where the, I right now do not know what port the inventory service is using, but I know my gateway is gonna be here. So the gateway has a fixed uh, endpoint that we can, uh, a fixed uh, URL and port number that we can access. Um, notice that we have to pass along our access token. So we are using JWT security here. Um, we have a timeout. Uh, this is just some Vue.js um, uh, nuance that we won't talk about right now. We load our JSON and um, we, we, the, J, the JSON that we get back from our request. And then we're able to populate our products, which if I go up here, products is part of the data of this component. So a Vue.js component, what, what other frameworks call state, the view calls data. So we, are, we have our uh, products array and we're able to populate that and that's how we can see that list of products. Now what I wanna talk about um, next is how we handle authentication. So notice that we have a tenant ID. Um, I mentioned already, this is a multi-tenant application. And so without this tenant, we don't get any data and we cannot get data from more than one tenant. Uh, we have to choose uh, which one we're going to be. And of course, obviously with your security system, that should be tied to uh, the users as well. So if I go back to my application here, we can see that in addition to my product list, which is, if I log back in here, oh, is that what's going on? Oh. Oh, my, my, it's, it's in all the way. Um, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll try to just give this some little sound bites so you can <laughs> uh, make it through. Um, so this is our product list component here. If we're logged out, we see my login component. So the login component, I just jump over there. Um, now I'm gonna panic every time that screen changes that it went out. Um, so uh, basic Vue.js form logic here. I'm not gonna walk through it. This isn't a Vue.js talk, although we should have one of those. Um, that, that, that would be a great topic for, for next time. Um, but I wanna show you the, the login because that's kind of interesting. So we make a request again to our gateway and that's interesting because we have an auth service that handles that. Not, our gateway doesn't do authentication. Um, and I'll just explain what's happening. It's proxying this request to the auth service and I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll explain how that happens in just a minute. So we make our fetch request. Uh, we post our API credential, our user credentials, which are provided to us by the um, the user through the UI. And if it works, we get back valid JSON. And then we emit an event. And this is again a viewism. Um, basically, this is a way for us to kind of asynchronously let the application know, hey, something happened. In this case, we got logged in and we have a token. We have a JSON that we need to parse. And so if I go back to my main view app, which is this app.view file, we can see here down, uh, we have a login method. This is going to be called when that event is emitted. And what, what is it gonna do? It's going to parse the access token and it's actually gonna get out the username, which is stored here uh, after I parse it. It's called the sub claim. And I can get a few other bits of metadata about our token. And now that I have this token, I'm storing it. I'm actually storing it in local storage because this is a demo. Uh, spoiler alert, don't do that. Local storage is not secure, you know, stipulated, but the, the right way would just take too long <laughs> for a demo. Uh, but what that means we can do is that now uh, we're able to reference, if I go back to our product list, when I made that request to get back those products for our tenant, I have this authorization header and I'm actually retrieving the access token from local storage. And that's what allows us to make that authenticated request to the gateway. So let me show you something here real quick. I'm gonna go to a different, so I have, a Docker image running where I have console, which is a service discovery, um, a service registry and service discovery um, uh, open source uh, framework. And we can see that I have an instance of my inventory service running. And it looks like it thinks my gateway is down. Um, not quite sure why it thinks that. Uh, okay, 
So notice that I can have multiple instances of a service running and console will basically make all of those available and Micronaut will actually automatically load balance. So Micronaut, again, natively cloud native, if there are multiple instances of the same service ID, Micronaut will actually um, alternate uh, and, and, and send the requests to different uh, instances to balance out the load. I'm not sure exactly why these uh, checks are failing, um, but I'm not going to belabor that. The, it's, it's working, so that's a good, <laughs> good sign. Um, looks like we may just have some zombie things hanging around from previous runs, which uh, that does happen. So I've, I've uh, run through this demo a few times. Um, notice, though, if I look at inventory, for example, this is where our products are coming from. This port number, 454590, oh, I'm so sorry about that. I, I, is it when I bump it? I'm going to try not touching any, but I, I can't because I, I don't have a clicker. I have to touch the laptop. Uh, first world problems, yeah? Okay, uh, 54590, so this is a random port number. Every time I run this application, it gets a different port number. I did not touch it. Is there a cable beneath me? Like, am I stepping on one? That doesn't look like it. It's the decimator, that's right, exactly. It's, it's literally gonna take a tenth of my talk away from you. Like, how dare it? Okay. <laughs> Well, I won't, um, I won't, again, won't belabor this too much because uh, we're gonna run out of time. This, this demo is, it's on, it's on my GitHub, the QR code that you'll get eventually, snap the picture really fast, has this whole, uh, the whole uh, has the instructions for how to set it up. Um, and it's an example, again, of, of having a gateway service that kind of wraps the microservice uh, architecture on, on the back end, but it uses token propagation, it uses security, it uses multi-tenancy, it uses, oh, I, I gotta show you this at least. I gotta show you the, do, the documentation. So this is on the gateway. Oops, what happened? Did I shut it down? I shut down my gateway. I hit control C out of habit sometimes. It's not a good habit. <laughs> like it should be control S, but somehow I got control C. My fingers got confused. All right, I'm gonna try running this again. Okay, this is the open API documentation or swagger docs that was generated by Micronaut at compilation time and I've, I've configured Micronaut to actually deploy it for me or, or, or expose it uh, at this Swagger UI URL on my gateway. So this would be a great way to expose the documentation. And it, the cool thing is that I didn't have to write any of this, okay? Micronaut is actually able to parse because it, 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 you know, you're using the, the controller annotations and you're using uh, the, the various a API conventions that Micronaut has. It's able to turn that into usable API documentation, which I can of course customize and I can add custom descriptions and what have you. So, and this is all interactive. So I can actually go here, if I click try it out. Oh, so sorry. Um, I'm filling out the login form. <laughs> Gonna put in the same credentials that I did earlier. And if I go ahead and hit execute, everything goes through here. Look at that. I can actually execute my API, interact with my API in the documentation. This is really cool. And it's, it's a kind of, I don't like working on a project now where we don't do this because it just makes things so much nicer for the clients of our API, whether it's our own front end team or whether it's just me. Um, it's just a really helpful way to, to document. And again, this documentation, it, it doesn't go out of date because it's being generated from your code, uh, which is also really cool. And I could then use this access token and I won't, but I could use it to then authenticate myself for these other requests that require um, an authentication, to an access token. Okay, I'm going to uh, jump out of here and wrap up uh, so we can talk about micro front ends real quick. So, let's see here, micro front ends. This is the, so I mentioned the gateway approach. That's, it's honestly, for most single page applications, it's not a groundbreaking um, you know, way, way of thinking. It's kind of what you end up doing automatically because the microservice uh, architecture is usually opaque. It's behind either a cloud gateway or a gateway service. Um, but micro front ends are, is a different way of approaching the same problem. And I'm just gonna skip over this. There's a great martinfowler.com uh, article uh, describing the pattern. Um, Spotify is probably one of the most popular applications that is known for using micro front ends. So the Spotify UI is made of multiple single page applications. There's one that is your friends list, and one's the library, and one is the player. They're all standalone single page applications, and if you're clever, you could probably figure out how to get to them on their own. 
and they're all put together. Now, Spotify, they cheat. They just use iframes, which I think is the, the least cool way of uh, doing micro front ends, but it, it is a, a way it's done. Um, so this is, again, some images from the Martin Fowler uh, uh, article, which I recommend you read. And again, the, I mentioned this at the beginning, the idea of micro front ends is to bring some of the lessons learned in microservices and actually help the front end folks benefit from this. And it's a new pattern, and I think it remains to be seen how successful it's going to be, but it's very interesting. And I have a, I have a demo here of it that I'll show you, even if I can't walk through it all uh, right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the, that's what this diagram is, that's a show. So yeah, you, you just, uh, just listen to what Todd said. Um, no, that's great, because that's absolutely right. So the, again, I mentioned at the beginning that the, the user interface, other, it tends to be a cross-cutting concern because we've got one front-end team that deals with everything, and you might have multiple back-end teams that are developing and deploying and scaling these independent services, but the front-end folks are essentially still in monolith land. Um, and so micro front-ends, I would say it's, it's a new pattern, and it's kind of an experiment in a way to see if if this, these idea of the ideas of a bounded context and separation of concerns, can we organize our front ends like we started to do with our service, uh, our microservice uh, uh, pattern? So that's the idea. It allows you to have independent teams that develop these single page applications for their particular stack of the system. Um, it kind of encourages you to think in terms of a vertical slice you know, within your architecture. Um, and you really want to avoid tying those together um, at least, you know, if there, if there do have to be elements of commonality between micro front ends, you should have some mechanism of sharing those assets, those resources that doesn't involve there being like the styling team that does CSS for everybody. Um, you want to find, uh, and, and again, this is, a, a, it's an architectural pattern. There's not one way it's done, but these are some things to be thinking about. Um, I'm going to skip over this a little bit. So if we look at our traditional API gateway approach, which really isn't that much different than just client and server, um, even though there's complexity under the hood, um, the micro front end approach gives you independent single page applications that deal with their own slice of your, your microservices architecture. And note, you, you could even use different frameworks. Um, but what gets really, because this on its own, is just separate single page applications. What makes micro front ends really interesting, at least for me, is when we take them together and we compose them and make literally a single application out of multiple single page applications, which is a little bit, uh, a little bit um, mind bending. Uh, there's a few different ways of doing it. I'm not gonna talk about them in detail. You can read the slides later. And I know uh, we're gonna wrap, have to wrap up here. But option three there is the one that I think is interesting. The first two, honestly, I just don't find, they're just not very groundbreaking. It's basically, you know, pick which single page application you go to based on what the user roles are, right? And that's a perfectly fine approach. But to me, micro front ends really come into their own when you start composing single page applications. And usually the tool of choice, and if you've done JavaScript development and, and single page apps, you've run into Webpack. And uh, it, it, whether you love it or it's the bane of your existence, uh, you, you can't really get away from it, even if it's uh, hidden behind a CLI of some sort. But Webpack is a very popular build tool in the JavaScript land that basically takes raw uh, source files and runs them through various plugins, or I think they call them loaders, and then outputs static assets that are ready to be served to a browser. And so there's a particular Webpack plugin that if you're interested in, in micro front ends, you really want to get to know this. It's called the Module Federation plugin. And we're just going to look at this in a demo because I don't want to spend all this time talking through it. There's a great video introduction there in the slides. You can check that out later. Let me show you this demo, walk through it, and then we will be done. So if I go back here, I'm going to close my uh, gateway example. Ugh. So here is our front end, micro front ends demo application. So you look at it, and it looks just like any old single page application. If I type in uh, some text here, click the button, I get back a message that came back from my, I got, I've got a, a microservice, a micro not, a microservice running in the background. Um, and it's serving up this message and adding a 
friendly exclamation point. I hope it's friendly anyways. Uh, now if I click this, this different, and right now you just have to trust me, this is a different application, but I'll prove it to you in a minute. If I click this button here, it actually loads a weather report, which is completely randomly generated, but it loads uh, from a different uh, endpoint on my, on my micro, Micronaut API. Now to prove to you that this is actually multiple applications, what I'm gonna do, notice the port number. I'm running on localhost 8000, right? If I go over here and I change that to 8001, this is the, app, the widget running on the left-hand pane. And it works the same way. Oops. But it does not work with form submissions. I'll have to fix that. Click the button. There we go. And if I go to 8001, 8002, sorry, there's my weather report. So these are two independent applications. They are running on their own server. And yet, they're both being served together as one application and this is being done through Webpack and this module federation plugin. Um, I don't think I have time to walk you through the code in detail. It, it's actually pretty simple, however. I'll just show you real quick. So the Webpack configuration file, um, which can be very intimidating, um, it's not as hard as it looks, but the part that's interesting here, if you look at where we define our module federation plugin, we are basically telling Webpack, hey, we want to expose this single page app that we've built and we want to expose it with the name micro app one. And the rest of the stuff here is just kind of boilerplate that has to happen for this to work. We had the exact same thing on the second micro front end. And then in my container application, it also uses the same module federation plugin, but it's being pointed to what are called remotes. And the remotes are the individual single page applications that are running. And the, it's able to actually access those remotely and pull them in and process them and actually create the unified experience from as many remote uh, SPAs that I actually want to, to add there. And uh, the back end is also interesting. Um, let's show you the controller real quickly here. So we've got a, a separate controller for the app one. So this is what provides us with that uh, friendly greeting. And then number two, this is what provides us with our weather report our fake weather, fake news weather, weather report. So that is single page front ends in a flash. Uh, a lot more we could talk about here, but I know that the raffle is happening really soon and you've all been very patient and I appreciate that. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I do have, like all the cool kids, a QR code. So snap a picture of that. That is the GitHub repo for the micro front ends demo you just saw, but it also has the link to um, the previous demo and to the slides and everything you need is yours through that QR code. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, our website, objectcomputing.com. Thank you all for coming. I will take questions. I'll, I'll hang out here as long as folks want to chat, but you're all free to go too. Yeah, we can look at that. It doesn't look like much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, if I had more time, I would have talked through this. So the container is the key. The container can have shared CSS, can have shared layout elements that apply to the entire set of the micro front ends. So if I go over to the, the container, that's, that's the more interesting one. So the container has an HTML template. Oh yeah, it's fine. So is that showing on the screen? Okay, yeah. So each micro front end is already looking for a particular um, ID to render to. That's a very common it's the way most single page apps work. They need to know where do I render on the HTML page. So this, this allows me to basically control the layout, right? If I was Spotify, this could be my main UI and then I could load all the various widgets and various uh, sub apps uh, and I could style them. Notice that the styling is all coming from the container, right? If I go over to the there's no styling here, right? So you actually can style them exactly through, the, through your container. So that's the key thing with this style of micro front end is that there's a container that can have this unified um, look and feel that applies to all the micro front ends. Yeah, web components are like, eh, they're, they're, they're messy, they're always on the verge of becoming the next big thing, but they never seem to get there. Uh -huh.
Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I follow them loosely for that is so annoying. I'm really bummed about that projector. You do? Okay. All right, that's cool. 